at Edmonton Public Library, we often talk about our role as in, in a democratic society, and what does that actually mean? In 1830, a young Parisian named Alexis de Tocqueville traveled the young United States, and the book that he would write, Democracy in America, was incredibly popular then, and it's still being widely read in American political science classes today. And he said that he wrote his book with a mind constantly preoccupied by a single thought, the thought of the approaching, irresistible, and universal spread of democracy throughout the world. He saw democracy as an inevitable consequence and one that had providential backing. He wrote in his preface to the book, a great democratic revolution is taking place in our midst. Everybody sees it. Everywhere the diverse happenings and the lives of peoples have turned to democracy's profit. All men have aided it, both those who intended this and those who had no such intention, those who had no such intention, those who fought for democracy and those who were the declared enemies thereof. All have been driven pell-mell along the same road and all have worked together, some against their will and some unconsciously, blind instruments in the hands of God. Therefore, the gradual progress of equality is something fated. Is it wise to suppose that a movement, a movement of society which has been so long in train can be halted by one generation? Does anyone imagine that democracy, which has destroyed the feudal system and vanquished kings, will fall back now when it has grown so strong and its adversaries so weak? One of the leaders of this ongoing march for democracy is Amy Goodman. She explores and uncovers the forces at work that seek to restrict democracy, that seek to restrict access to information, as well as uncover the journalistic forces that seek to create a reality rather than to report it. Amy Goodman is the award-winning investigative journalist and syndicated columnist and author of Democracy Now!, which now airs on more than 900 public television and radio stations worldwide. She's the first journalist to receive the Right Livelihood, the Right Livelihood Award, which is widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for developing an innovative model of truly independent grassroots political journalism that brings to millions of people the alternative voices that are often excluded from the mainstream media. She's the author of four New York Times bestsellers. Her latest book, Breaking the Sound Barrier, proves the power of independent journalism in the struggle for a better world. She co-authored her, her first three bestsellers, Standing Up to Madness, Static, and The Exception to the Rulers with her brother, journalist David Goodman. From being beaten in East Timor to her expose in Nigeria called Killing and Drilling Chevron and Nigeria's Oil Dictatorship, for which she won the George Polk Award, Amy Goodman has struggled to give voice to the voiceless. On behalf of the Edmonton Public Library, it is my pleasure to welcome Amy Goodman to Edmonton. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be with all of you. And it's really a great honor to be invited by the Edmonton Public Library. My dad sat on the board of our local library in New York for 25 years. It was at the end of our street, so it was like our living room. After school, me and my brothers would go there. It's why for years, I spoke hardly above a whisper, because when I would go to the library, any time I'd say something, the librarians would shush me. And so I sort of, that's how I grew up. But not really, because I think librarians are the freedom fighters of our time. My brother David and I, one of the books that we wrote uh, was called Standing Up to the Madness, Ordinary Heroes in Extraordinary Times. And we have a chapter devoted to the librarians of Connecticut. Uh, because, well, this past week is the 10th anniversary of President Bush signing the USA Patriot Act. And <clears throat> about six years ago, a librarian in Connecticut named George 
Christian, who is head of a nonprofit of um, a bunch of libraries, the internet system that interconnected them, was sitting in his office when two FBI agents came to the door. They knocked, he answered, and they said they needed to have information about people using the internet on a certain day at a certain time. And they handed him <clears throat> a document um, that was called an NSL, a National Security Letter. And he opened it, he read it, um, he looked up as it demanded this information. He said, I believe this is unconstitutional and I won't be giving you this information. They looked at him pityingly like a predator sizing up his prey. <clears throat> they handed them their cards and said, you get back to us. He didn't know what to do because when he read this letter, it said um, that he could not tell anyone about having received this. Now, this is a problem when you're the head of an organization, you're sort of accountable to people. Um, if you tell anyone you've received a national security letter and hundreds of thousands have been given out in the United States, perhaps more, um, you face up to five years in prison. Like you can't tell your boss, you can't tell someone you work with, you can't tell your partner, you can tell no one. He didn't even know if he could tell his lawyer. Um, so he called a meeting of the chair, of the board of his organization, the library organization. And one of the people he called had just been asked to be on this. It was a voluntary board and they had said to him, please sir, for a year we'll call you vice president um, and it will just help us a lot. You'll have nothing to do. And before he knew it, he and other members of this board were being called, told not to tell anyone where they were going. They were to have a meeting um, with George Christian and they raced to his office. He closed the door, they had, a they had a lawyer there and he revealed to them the NSL which made them all radioactive because anyone who saw it could then not reveal information that they had. Um, the lawyer took off, she said this was way beyond her pay scale and that they'd have to call the American Civil Liberties Union and they did and they sued the US government and they tried to use this opportunity as a way to take down the USA Patriot Act. It was an astonishing story. They could not be named. They were John Doe um, uh, versus the US government trying to take down the USA Patriot Act. And one day when one of the members of this board was coming home, somehow the US government had released their names at some point in the court documents, you know, even when they're trying to be in control, there are mistakes made. And so the New York Times and other news organizations called one of the members' homes and their high school son answered. So when he got home, his son came out because they had said something about a court case, his father was under investigation. And um, he said, Dad, the newspapers have called. They want to know, he said, you did not hear anything about that call. I don't want you ever to repeat it again. And he looks at his father and he says, Dad, are you involved with drugs? <laughs> <laughs> well, they may not have seeded, succeeded in taking down the USA Patriot Act, but they did succeed in having the, um, the gag order lifted and they were the first people in the United States able to talk about having received a national security letter and they went on to talk about the dangers of the USA Patriot Act. The problem was during the whole period of the debate of re-instituting um, the USA Patriot Act, they were not able to speak because they were involved in this court case with the US government. Um, these are very serious times when people are afraid of speaking out. I think libraries are all about open information and that's what they were protecting. They said, we're not here to surveil or to monitor the patrons of the library, we're here to get them information. Which is why when I speak at libraries across the country and you have the librarians on the side and all the students there with um, pierced noses and dreads and everything else, I said, you guys have to understand 
these are the ones that are taking the risk. These guys are the freedom fighters of our times. And they look over and I tell the story. And um, it is critical that we understand people in so many different walks of life are risking so much to ensure democracy in the United States and Canada and all over the world. A big shout out to KJSW uh, that Democracy Now! broadcasts on in Calgary, KJSR in Edmonton, K -K -K CKXU in Lethbridge. Um, we are a daily global grassroots news hour. We began 15 years ago as the only daily election show in public broadcasting. And it has been just astounding how fast it has grown now. At least a station a week is picking Democracy Now! up, either a public radio station or a television station in the United States and Canada or around the world. I originally come from Pacifica Radio, which was founded more than 60 years ago after World War II by a man named Lou Hill who refused to fight in World War II. He was a conscientious objector. And when he came out of the detention camps, he said, there's got to be a media outlet that is not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born. The first Pacifica station was KPFA in Berkeley, went on the air in 1949. Not run by corporations as George Gerbner, um, former dean at the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania said, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. The second Pacifica station, KPFK in Los Angeles, my station in New York, WBAI. Um, Washington has a station, WPFW, and KPFT in Houston. In fact, I was just fundraising on KPFT uh, yesterday. Um, we raise money from listeners. We don't turn to corporations because we deeply believe that in order to bring out information, um, when we're covering war, we shouldn't be brought to you by weapons manufacturers. When we're covering the healthcare debate, we shouldn't be brought to you by insurance companies or big pharma. When we're covering global warming, we shouldn't be brought to you by the gas, coal, oil companies, by the nuclear companies. We need a media outlet that is brought to you by listeners and viewers like you. Independent media is what will save us. Dissent is what will save us. And by the way, I view libraries as the greatest sanctuaries of dissent. Places you can go and lose yourself. Uh, reading books, people who lived long ago or in different parts of the world that you get to meet to commune with their ideas and how important libraries are as are independent bookstores, and it's wonderful to work with Audrey's tonight. Uh, independent bookstores that are so under threat. In the United States, we've lost thousands of them over the last years. But they're places that we go for refuge, for our minds to be liberated, to be inspired, to be infuriated, to be um, educated. <clears throat> and so, KPFT in Houston, one of the five Pacifica stations, is the only radio station in the United States to have been blown up. It went on the air in 1970, the spring of 1970. It was on the air for a few weeks, and then the Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. Now, it's not as if Pacific had money for advertising. And so the silver lining was it certainly blew it into the consciousness of the potential listening audience <laughs> of a very important area of the country. We call it the Petro Metro, right? The oil city of Houston. And then when they got back on their feet, the Klan blew it up again. I don't know if it was the Exalted Cyclops or the Grand Dragon. I often confuse their titles. <laughs> but he said it was his proudest act. I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is, how dangerous independent media is, because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it is a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it's an uncle from Afghanistan or an aunt from Iraq, 
You say, it sounds like my baby, my bubba, my aunt, my grandmother. And you know, you don't have to agree with what you're listening to. How often do you agree with other members of your family? But you begin to understand where they're coming from. You begin to find common ground. And that is the beginning of breaking down caricatures and stereotypes that fuel the hate groups. The media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. But instead, it is used, it is wielded as a weapon of war. And that has to be challenged. I am. I'm really excited to be with you tonight, to have made it here. I, <clears throat> I've attempted a number of times to come into Canada. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm detained and maybe a little late. Well, I'll talk about a few of those experiences. The last time, October, I was so incredibly disappointed, but you know, it was Minneapolis, we took off, and just as we were flying over the border, the pilot said, I'm sorry, we'll be turning back. The um, engines failed, and the Edmonton graphic designer who was sitting next to me, she said, did he say engines or engine? <laughs> I said, I'm not sure, but that was soon after. He said something about, and we said, well, like, what's going to happen? He said, we won't be talking about future right now. And we said, what did he say? <laughs> and then we headed back to um, Minneapolis, and I was very appreciative. I felt horrible that I couldn't get here. I couldn't believe it was a packed flight. They weren't providing another plane. And I called Jason and I told him the story and he said, thank God. And I said, why are you saying thank God? Was there some trouble with me coming up? And he said, no, thank God you're okay. I said, oh my God, you clearly are Canadian. <laughs> that would not have been the response of someone who was waiting um, in the United States. Now, <clears throat> the reason I also was so upset is because of previous trouble I had had coming into Canada. Some of you may know that story. I think it was November, um, I know it was Thanksgiving time in the United States, November 2009. And um, we had just published Breaking the Sound Barrier. I wrote it with my colleague Dennis Moynihan, and it has a wonderful foreword by Bill Moyers um, talking about the importance of independent media. And we were driving up from Seattle, since it was Thanksgiving in the United States, um, we figured they're all eating turkey, so we'll talk turkey in Canada. And we were invited by the Vancouver Public Library. We we're doing a fundraiser for three community radio stations um, that air Democracy Now. And so we thought we'd just come up over the border, coming up from Seattle, and um, give the talk. And when we came up uh, to the border, uh, we handed in our passports and we were flagged. The border patrol said, you've got to get out of your car, go into the border facility. We went in this huge cavernous warehouse-like border crossing. Some of you, hopefully you haven't had to be there, but we were sitting and they said, Amy, we want you to come up. And so I went up to the counter and they said, we need your notes right now. And so I said, my notes for what? I gave you my passport. No, your notes for what you're gonna be talking about tonight. Now, um, the thing is, I don't usually carry notes. Uh, and I didn't know how to quite, ex I said, well, and I said, I don't really have notes for the talk. And he said, and you're claiming you're giving talk tonight. I said, yes. Uh, and so I said, well, wait, let me go out to the car. And we had lots of books in the car. And I really don't like it when a picture of the author is on the cover, but I was very thankful at that moment that this was. So I brought back the book and I handed it to the border patrol. Now the guards were standing. And um, I said, I actually will read columns from the book and sort of riff off of them. And so one of the guards was starting to read. I thought that was a good thing, read the book. <laughs> and another, and another, was writing down everything. One was handwriting, one was writing into a computer. He said, so what are you gonna talk about? And so I said, tonight at the talk? And so I said, you could come, it's a public talk. <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? So I said, well, I thought I would start with the last column in the book. Um, <clears throat> it's about, well, it says, Imagine the scene, America 2009, 
18,000 people have died in a year, an average of almost 50 a day. Who's taking them out? Who's killing them? To investigate, President Obama might be tempted to call on Jack Bauer, the fictional rogue intelligence agent from the hit TV series 24, who invariably employs torture and a host of other illegal tactics to help the president fight terrorism. But terrorism isn't the culprit here. It's lack of adequate health care. So maybe the president's solution is not Jack Bauer, but rather the actor who plays him. The star of 24 is played by Kiefer Sutherland, whose family has very deep connections to health care reform Absolutely. in Canada. Sutherland is the grandson of the late Tommy Douglas, the pioneering Canadian politician credited with creating the modern Canadian health care system. And they were taking rapid notes. <laughs> so I just kept on reading. And <clears throat> I said Rush Limbaugh and Fox News Channel's Glenn Beck and insurance industry funded groups are encouraging people to disrupt town halls around the United States. Um, Rush Limbaugh says 24 is one of his favorite shows. He's even visited the set. He should learn from the real life actor who plays his hero Jack Limbaugh and his cohorts might find truth not as satisfying as fiction. In 2004, a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation poll named Tommy Douglas the greatest Canadian. At a protest in 2000 against efforts to roll back the Medicare system in the province of Alberta, Kiefer Sutherland defended Canada's public single-payer system. He said private health care does not work. America's trying to change their system. It's too expensive to get comprehensive medical care in the U.S. Why on earth are we going to follow their system here? I consider it a humanitarian issue, Kiefer Sutherland said at a speech here in Alberta. This is an issue about what is right and wrong, what is decent and what is not, he said. Maybe Jack Bauer can save the day, I said, looking at the border guards. <laughs> and I said, my goodness, you know, you've detained me. I'm coming here to talk about the importance of the model you have set with your health care system. Sarah Palin was just here. She was ripping you guys apart. Did you detain her? Anyway, he said, what else are you talking about? I said, at the talk tonight? He said, yes. So I said, well, I'm going to talk about the economic meltdown. What else are you talking about? And I said, well, probably. And I thought maybe this was it. Take on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Maybe this is what was troubling him. What else are you talking about? I said, well, that about sums it up. I only have an hour. And he said, are you denying you're going to be talking about the Vancouver Olympics? <laughs> Now that is also something that my family clearly laughed at because I don't really talk sports. <laughs> I like to do sports, but I, this was right before the Vancouver Olympics, but I honestly did not know what he was talking about. So, which of course made him believe I was not telling the truth even more because who couldn't know that the Vancouver Olympics, so I said, he said, are you, no, he said, are you denying that you're going to be speaking about the Olympics? So I said, the Olympics? I said, you mean that President Obama went to Copenhagen to try to get the Olympics in the United States? He said, and he didn't get them. I said, I know he didn't get them. I said, do you mean that Rio got the Olympics? And so he said, I'm talking about the Vancouver Olympics. Oh. I said, I was not planning to talk about the Olympics. <laughs> and so they went out to the car. It was pouring rain. And they went through everything. After a while, I went out to the car to see what they were doing. They were on our computers. They were going through all of our notes. This was compromising us as reporters, notes we had, everything. They told me to get back inside. And after a while, they came back in. They pulled me into a side room. They took a number of pictures of me. They took numbers. Uh, they took pictures of my colleagues. They uh, stapled into my passport um, uh, travel documents. I said, I didn't think we needed a visa to come into Canada. And they said, we could stay for 48 hours, and then we had to get out. So <clears throat> we got back in the car. I had called the head librarian at the Vancouver Public Library to apologize for being late. But again, because, I mean, we were an hour or two late. But because it was Canada and not the United States, Everyone had gone out for beer and had come back. And then the size of the crowd doubled because people heard what had taken place. So 
I gave the talk that night, completely shocked at what was happening. I couldn't even quite understand why they were so concerned. And then I was going on to speak at the University of Victoria. And we're staying at a bed and breakfast. We walked in, it was about five to six or something in the evening, and then we're gonna go off to the talk. And very lovely, civilized, dainty place. And everyone was just about to have their tea before dinner, and they were sitting, and the news was on. It was just about to come on, and I sat down. And all of a sudden, the pictures of <clears throat> me were being arrested at another point, which I'll explain in a minute, race being dragged across the screen and saying, you know, American journalists detained on the Canadian border. This was the CB CBC, the top TV story. And everyone looked over at me. <laughs> I said, no. Um, but the, the stories that followed that explained to me why they were so concerned. It was stories about the British uh, Columbia Civil Liberties Association, stories about legislation that had just been passed in Vancouver uh, that allowed homes to be raided if signs were in the windows that spoke out against the Olympics, that athletes were not allowed to criticize corporations that were sponsoring the Olympics. And then I started to understand why they were so concerned that I would possibly be speaking. Of course, that does not justify what they had done. Um, but we have to be very careful about the corporate control or government control of information and speech. Again, it's that freedom of speech and thought of assembly that will ultimately save all of us, including the guards, including those that would crack down. So I'm really happy to have come into Canada. We weren't turned around today, and I wasn't stopped at the border, so it's wonderful to be with you. But, The picture that they were showing at the top of the CBC newscast went back just a year before, and it went back to the Republican Convention of 2008, to the first day, September 1st, 2008, the day that me and my colleagues were arrested for covering the convention. Now, you know, these conventions are supposed to be celebrations of democracy. We're moving into the next ones uh, this summer in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Tampa, Florida for the Republicans and Democrats. And at that time, in 2008, we had just come from the Democratic Convention in Denver and flew into St. Paul. The convention was starting in the evening, but that morning was a mass protest of 10,000 people marching for peace, led by soldiers, some in full uniform. Um, which is taking great risk to do this. Some had served, some were refusing to serve. And they were marching against war, but followed by thousands of civilians. So we were out covering them and talking to them, recording what they were saying, asking them questions. And then I went off to the convention to cover the delegates that were gathering there. I was interviewing delegates from the hottest state, from Alaska. Sarah Palin had just been <clears throat> named as the vice presidential nominee a few days before, and we were coming to learn about her. Um, and my colleagues went back to the public access TV studio to digitize tape. We were doing special two-hour broadcasts for the week. And then I got a call on my cell phone from our senior producer, Mike Burke. He said, come quickly to 7th and Jackson. Nicole and Sharif have been arrested, and they've been bloodied. And I said, what are you, what are you talking about? They're at the TV station. They said, no, they're hurt. You've got to come quickly. So we raced off the convention floor. I was with our cameraman, who is Rick Rowley of Big Noise Films, and I hope you see all of Big Noise Films, uh, films uh, like uh, Zapatista and Fourth World War. They're excellent films. Um, we raced down the streets of St. Paul and made our way to this corner, 7th and Jackson. There were riot police lined up. They had fully contained the area. And you know, I was coming from the convention floor. I had all my top, sec top security clearance credentials on that allow me to interview presidents and vice presidents and delegates. So I'm coming up to the riot police line, and I'm running along it to find a police officer I could talk to. And I stop in front of one, and I say, you know, I'm Amy Goodman. I, uh, I just came from the convention floor. You can see I'm fully credentialed, and two of our reporters are inside. They've been arrested. They're credentialed like I am. We need to have them released. I need to speak to a commanding officer. 
It wasn't seconds before he ripped me through that line, twisted my arms back, slapped the handcuffs on, they pushed me up against a car and against the wall onto the ground. I was saying, please don't arrest me. Please don't arrest me. You can see I'm a journalist. I'm desperately still on the ground looking for Sharif and Nicole. I see Sharif across the parking lot, his hands behind his back. I demand to be brought to him. Finally, I am. We're both standing there handcuffed, demanding to be released as journalists. Uh, police are all around us. Um, whereupon the Secret Service comes over and rips the credentials from around our necks. Um, I was charged with a misdemeanor, interfering with a peace officer, if only there was a peace officer in the vicinity. <laughs> and I'm brought into the police van, and that's where I see Nicole. Sharif's arm was bloodied. And she quickly told me what had happened. She said that they had been in the TV studio, they heard a commotion outside, they grabbed camera, microphone, they raced downstairs, uh, they started to film, they were in this parking lot, the riot police were coming at them, so as she's filming, uh, and they're <clears throat> shouting at her, on your face, on your face, she's holding up her press credential and shouting back, press, press. Um, they are coming at her so fast in full uh, poli riot police regalia. You know, the helmets, the, uh, they have weapons, they've got their batons uh, covered in black. And they are coming at her so fast, she has nowhere to go because she's in a parking lot. She's trapped against parked car cars, as they say, on your face. She's shouting press, press, not expecting to film her own violent arrest, but that's just what happened. And then they took her down on her face, both from in front of her and behind. They um, slammed her down onto her face. Uh, <clears throat> her camera tumbled down. They had knee or boot in her back. They were pulling on her leg and that was dragging her face in the dirt, which is why her face was bloodied. And the first thing they did was pull the battery out of her camera. If you were wondering what it was they wanted to stop happening. Sharif, um, Sharif Abdel Kaddus, how many of you listen to or watch Democracy Now? <laughs> right. Well, I, pass, I hope you pass these flyers around far and wide. Um, on, you can listen on the radio, you can watch, you can read the uh, shows at democracynow.org. You may know Sharif from his remarkable reporting from Tahrir Square in Egypt this past year when he flew home into Tahrir to bring you the voices of, well, of the revolution that I think is being felt today in Edmonton and on Wall Street and all over the country. I mean, just the remarkable work of Sharif cannot be underestimated. He worked with us for eight years as senior producer. And those of you uh, who know uh, what he did, you know, when Mubarak brought the internet down, uh, Sharif joked that that was his fatal error. Because, you know, he said, we're Egyptian. We would have been inside doing Facebook and tweeting. And now we couldn't do that. So we all had to go outside and talk <laughs> or see what was going on. <laughs> Um, but when they brought the internet down, Sharif figured out a way around it, and he became one of the top tweeters in the world. You know, he was uh, being cited on all of the networks, CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, uh, BBC, uh, being interviewed. He was right in Tahrir. Um, and then when the internet went up, but the thugs knocked the satellites out, the corporate networks like CNN, they then couldn't broadcast because they're used to depending on satellites. So you saw Anderson Cooper um, reporting, looking a little like Democracy Now! on Skype um, from his hotel room in the lower third said, reporting from an undisclosed location. And you contrast that with Sharif, who was saying who he was and where he was in the middle of Tahrir, which he said was the safest place to be at that moment. And he was being interviewed by everyone and sending um, 20, 25 minute video reports so that you could meet the people of Tahrir. And we were sending them through the internet. We use satellite too, like the big boys, but we have always from the beginning uh, figured out a way to uh, hack the internet to send broadcast quality video because, well, necessity is the mother of invention and it's expensive to use these satellites. And, you know, like during Saddam's time in Iraq, unlike CNN and the networks, we didn't want to pay him millions of dollars to use satellites. You know, that's what they did. 
Um, and so Jeremy Scahill, the great Jeremy, who wrote Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, and Jackie Suin from Big Noise Films, when they were reporting for us from Iraq, they would go into an internet cafe and use a program uh, called Split at the time. This was years ago. So they'd send the video in like 150 emails, and it would go through kind of like your backdoor screen, and it would be sent, and we would piece it back together in New York and have these amazing reports from Iraq. So here was Sharif sending these reports when the networks were just showing themselves. And you would meet the greats, right? Ahadef Suef, the great Egyptian writer who wrote Map of Love. Um, when Mubarak went down uh, and we called her, she said, I've just left two very pregnant women in Tahrir. Now they can have their babies in freedom. Or you met Nawal Sadawi, the 79-year-old Egyptian feminist who'd run for president, who'd been imprisoned under Sadat, had been exiled under Mubarak. And you hear her talking about how she knew this day would come, and she'd always been telling the young bloggers who'd come to her salons every week, this will happen, she said. She, who had gone through so much for so many decades, or the young high school girl who was putting out Voices of Tahrir, the broadsheet, in the shadow of these mass state media that been, had been lying for so long. And you would meet them as your family or as your community. That is the power of independent media, that you get to hear and listen to and watch and read people speaking for themselves. That's the power of what Sharif brought us. And it's precisely what he was trying to do at the Republican convention, at the Democratic convention, was bring you these voices too in the United States. That's what we were doing. So Nicole describes to me what happened to her in the van with her face bloodied, with her credentials on, and I'm brought off to the police garage where they've erected cages to put the protesters in. And Sharif and Nicole faced felony riot charges and they were sent to jail. So the YouTube video of my arrest and Nicole's arrest was posted within a half an hour. And it went viral, the most, you, most watched YouTube video of the first two days of the Republican convention. But the response was tremendous. More than 10,000 people called in the St. Paul, Minneapolis authorities, the Twin City authorities, um, which is why I liked coming into Minneapolis State and then making my way right out, coming to Edmonton. <laughs> um, uh, more than 10,000 tweets, emails, faxes, phone calls, and we were freed after a number of hours. And to show the power of that grassroots response, Sharif was in a cell with the AP photographer. Sharif got out before he did. <laughs> so I'm then brought to the convention because the networks want to talk to me, like what happened? You know, they, they arrested more than 40 reporters that week. So I'm in the NBC skybox and they finish the interview and a reporter comes over to me, an NBC reporter says, I don't get it, why wasn't I arrested? So I, said, so I said, oh, were you outside covering the protest? And he said, no. So I said, well, I'm not being arrested in the skybox either. Um, as Woody Allen says, 90% of life is just showing up. You, you've got to get out there. And, you know, that's really true. That's our job. We not only should be on the convention floor covering what's happening there, we should be in the corporate suites. Who's sponsoring the Republican Governors Association, like the Koch brothers, for example? Um, who is sponsoring the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committees, you know, with the DNC? That's our job, too. You don't know how many doors got slammed in my face as I would go into these corporate suites reaching for an order because, you know, that's what they're doing in the suites. They're fetting the various delegates from all of the states. And so I would just be reaching. But to find out actually the information, you know, uh, with a morsel of food comes a bit of information. And those doors got closed on me very quickly. But that's okay. We're trying, and they're trying to obscure the information, but that's our job as journalists to dig. And then our job is to get outside to where the thousands of uninvited guests are. And they have something very important to say as well. You know, democracy is a messy thing, and it's our job to capture it all. And we shouldn't have to get a record when we put things on the record. So, the next day, I went to the 
St. Paul Police Chief's news conference. And the officer who opened the door to the press conference was my processing officer the night before. I said, you not only have to let me into this news conference, you have to let me out when it's done. <laughs> so I went into the news conference and uh, you know, asked Chief Harrington a question. I said, you know, he, was, he called the news conference to tell you how successful the police operation had been. And I said, what have you instructed? First, I described what happened to Sharif Nicole and me. And then I said, what have you instructed your officers to do? And how do you expect us to operate in this environment? And he said, we could embed, embed in the mobile field force, embed in the police mobile field force. The next day, I saw a Fox reporter in the middle of a kind of moving organism of police as they're making their way down the street. That is not my idea of what reporting is, what good reporting is. In fact, you know what they're talking about, like embedding in the front lines of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm not saying reporters aren't brave who do that, but what are you getting from that perspective? I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. Um, you know, the Pentagon has said that the embedding process has been a spectacular success for them which is why I think it's brought the media to an all-time low. Um, because what are you getting from that perspective when you are embedded? You're sleeping with the troops, you're eating with them, your life is in their hands. How do you think you're going to cover the war? Well, certainly from the trigger end. And it's our job to capture the war. Also embedded in Iraqi communities and Afghan hospitals and the peace movement around the world, we have got to understand the full effects of war. And if they are now importing that model to be used for how we cover American cities, it is not acceptable. It is not only a violation of the freedom of the press, it's a violation of the public's right to know because when the press is inhibited, it is harder for you to get information, which is why we sued the St. Paul Minneapolis police and the federal government, the Secret Service, for what they did. And last week, two weeks ago, um, we reached a settlement. Um, it was the police have agreed to a six-figure settlement uh, we negotiated all day in Minneapolis at a point when they said they would not even begin to engage in settlement talks. I mean, the videotape was so painfully clear what had taken place. In fact, in deposition, um, the police officer who arrested me when my lawyer was deposing her, uh, him, um, she said to him, I'm going to run this videotape and you tell me at what point Amy broke the law and the videotape ran once, and he's, she said, stop me at any point, and I'll make the mark at 13 seconds, at 15 seconds in the videotape, at 20 seconds, um, and it passed through once, he didn't say anything. And she said, well, you've got to tell me at what point did she, you know, because you arrested her, so she must have broken the law at some point. And then even before she started again, he said, right there, this is just when I was running from the convention. And she said, but she's just coming across the street. And he said, yes, right there. And so he said, just her showing up. And she said, really? And she said, but what was the problem with that? She said, she passed my threshold of what is fine. And she said, is this a, a legal standard? <laughs> and then the police had said, I hurled myself across the police line. Um, but the videotape clearly shows that I was standing there asking the officer to speak with the commanding officer. And at some point, this police officer walked in front of me. And he said, right there, she crossed the line. She said, but Amy didn't move, you moved. And he said, that's right, the line was fluid. <laughs> so they were forced to settle. Um, but it was not only the six-figure settlement that was key, it was the fact that the St. Paul police have agreed to setting up a training program for their police officers, and hopefully the Minneapolis police and the state authorities will also agree to this. And also to win against the Secret Service, it almost never happens to get any kind of financial 
settlement out of the Secret Service, the ones who had ripped our credentials from around our necks. And we made the announcement of the settlement at Occupy Wall Street um, because uh, we felt it's absolutely critical to send a message to the police who are dealing with all of these demonstrations um, really across the continent, it's not just the United States, and also as we move into the next conventions, that they will have to pay if they engage in these illegal arrests and if they continue to arrest journalists. How often we have heard at Occupy Wall Street demonstrations in New York, the police telling people to turn their video cameras off. That's just when you should be turning them on. And And every good police officer knows that and appreciates it. You know, there was a point last Saturday night when I was covering a mass protest in Times Square, Occupy Wall Street had marched up. I mean, the tens of thousands of people that are just involved with this in New York City alone at different points. But they had the uh, riot police out, they had the horses confronting the protesters. We were um, caught by the uh, riot um, barricades that they had set up and the police were moving in and the four-star commanding officer first when the horses were spurred on to attack the crowd one of the horses went down uh, and would not move forward I don't know if the horse was engaging in civil disobedience <laughs> but it stopped the entire movement of the police they were so shocked that this horse had not obeyed and then the top commanding officer under the police chief came, and as the police are moving in, and the commanding officer comes, and he says, move back, and the protesters at thought, first thought they, he was talking to them. He was talking to the police. Now, the protesters aren't there to confront police. They are there to make another point. And as soon as the commanding officer said to the police, move back, the entire situation which became very dangerous, completely dissipated because the protesters weren't protesting the police. They were protesting uh, corporate control. They were protesting inequality. They were protesting poverty. They were protesting war. Um, and as soon as the police backed off, the protests continued, and then everyone, the police and the protesters, went home or went back to the encampment. And that's a very important point. Police are supposed to be peace officers. And when this happened, the protesters started chanting, police are the 99%. Police are the 99%. And we saw that in Madison, Wisconsin, right? That mass protest of 150,000 people was so significant when Governor Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, tried to eviscerate public unions prevent them from being able to bargain, to break the unions. It wasn't just the teachers and the nurses went out who the governor was targeting. He explicitly said, I am not targeting the police and firefighters. But the police and firefighters would have none of that. They said, if you are targeting the corrections officers, the nurses, the teachers, you're targeting us. And they knew full well that once they're wiped out, that they will be the next ones to be targeted. But whether they would or would not be, and you know, the governor knew what was good for him and knew not to target the police. But the police said, no, we stand with our sister and fellow teachers. We stand with the nurses. And every night they occupied the state capitol. And on one night it would be all the nurses and their families sleeping there. And the next night it would be all the uh, teachers and their families sleeping there. And the police officers would sleep there too, to protect them. And we saw a very different dynamic growing up. And I think that, in addition to Egypt and Tunisia, is fueling what we're seeing in New York, in Edmonton, in Calgary, in Oakland, in Austin, in Boston, all over the world right now, and more than a 1,000 actions that we are seeing. And it's very, very significant. Um, I also think something else has fueled these protests. You know, you never know when the moment will come. But when it does, if you're involved in social change, you will help to determine history. You will help to determine the future. Think of the mass protests that took place just at the end of August in Washington. The protests against the um, Keystone XL pipeline were more than 1,200... <laughs> Thank you.
where more than 1,200 people got arrested in front of the White House. President Obama was on vacation for part of it, but then he came back and it was just waves of people. Now that ultimately ended. And if you think, well, where did that get anyone? Don't be so sure that each one of these doesn't fuel the next wave, not to mention what will happen ultimately with Keystone XL. I mean, you know about the emails that have come out uh, that show the close relationship between the State Department and Paul Elliott, the lobbyist for TransCanada. Um, some amazing email because he was what the deputy campaign manager for Hillary Clinton in the 2008 presidential campaign. And so TransCanada is very smart in hiring him because it is the State Department that will or will not approve this deal. Um, very recently, President Obama was having yet another fundraiser because he is planning to raise over a billion dollars for the next election. You know, the Republicans and the Democrats are in this together in that way. They're both raising enormous sums of money. At one of his events, people interrupted the event and they started chanting about the Keystone XL pipeline. And interestingly, he said something like, don't think I don't understand what you're saying. Now that su might suggest something, you know, the decision hasn't been made, we will see. But clearly he knows, he has heard, and that presence outside the White House made an enormous difference, not only for that particular issue, but I think in fueling so much of what has happened. Well, let's talk about um, how important social movements are. You know, after President Obama was elected, well, you know, November 2008, this was an historic moment in the United States, whether people voted for him or not, I think the whole world heaved a sigh of relief that night. Um, in a land with a legacy of slavery, we have our first African-American president. So many different movements converged, particularly young people, particularly the anti-war movement. The only real difference between Obama and Hillary Clinton was their position on war, right? President, well, Senator Obama, it wasn't even Senator at the time the Iraq war had started, spoke out against the war. And Hillary Clinton hung out onto that war to the end. She voted to authorize it, and she would not say she made a mistake right until the end when she saw she was losing, and then she said, maybe I cast the wrong vote. So this was very, very significant, but also very disturbing for people today when Obama has come to own the war in Afghanistan. It's Obama's war, it's Obama's surge, and many people are very distressed about the president they elected. You know, what do you do when the, he was a community organizer before, the community organizer in chief becomes the commander in chief? Um, the good thing is parents all over the country, perhaps the world, are saying to their kids, maybe you can be a community organizer too. <laughs> but what do people do when he is elected? They see a big right-wing backlash. They don't want to be a part of that. They're also tired. They worked very hard to get him elected. They think the moment has come. But all that happened was that people felt they had hit their head against a brick wall for so long and that wall had become a door. The door was open to crack and the question was, would it be kicked open or slammed shut? It's not up to that one person. It's up to all these very movements that elected him and more to make demands. You know what Frederick Douglass, the greatest abolitionist, the fighter against slavery in the United States says, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So um, where do we stand today? When President Obama was elected, I was invited on CNN to comment when he and Michelle Obama were entering the White House, just visiting the Bushes before they were inaugurated, uh, when Bush was still president. So I'm in CNN and they have other pundits, uh, you know, in different places. I, I don't consider myself a pundit. I, I mean, think about the pundits you watch on television. This small circle of pundits who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. Um, but I was invited on, and they're showing the Obamas walking into the White House. It's you know historic, and they're talking about something else. I said, wait a second, we have to take pause. Barack Hussein Obama, Michelle LaVon Robinson Obama, 
she is the descendant of slaves, which means their kids, Sasha and Malia, are the descendants of slaves, are walking into the White House, which they will soon inhabit, the most famous house on earth, which was built by slaves. Let's just take pause. And I thought about a house not so far from the White House, hours away on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, I thought about Frederick Douglass. He was born on the eastern shore of Maryland. He was enslaved as a youth and a teenager. It might not surprise you to know he was a troublesome slave. So he was handed over to a man called a slave breaker named Ed Covey. Ed Covey's property was count, called Mount Misery. And there, Ed Covey beat Frederick Douglass. He was tortured there. But Frederick Douglass escaped, came north, and changed the world. Um, he started the North Star newspaper. He took refuge in a house in Lower Manhattan, which is now an independent coffee shop. And um, I've spent a lot of time there. And I saw on the outside, there's this plaque that says, David Ruggles, born a free black man in Connecticut, had a printing press here. And he first sheltered Frederick Douglass when he came north. Think about it. Frederick Douglass started the North Star newspaper. He was a publisher. He was a writer. Um, David Ruggles had a printing press. These men saw the media as their form of liberation because information is power. So back to Mount Misery, where Frederick Douglass was tortured. Mount Misery is owned today by Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> he bought it in 2003 to be near his close friend, Vice President Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense at the time. He bought Mount Misery to be his vacation home. Um, so I read about this, and I started to research it. But as a journalist, I had to see this with my own eyes. So um, Dennis Moynihan and I headed down to St. Michael's, Maryland. And when we got there, I realized I have no idea where Donald Rumsfeld lives. So I see this organic coffee shop ahead of us. You see a theme in my life. And um, I said, well, why don't we go in there? Because they'll tell the truth. So we went inside. And uh, they said, what would you like? I said, I'd like to know where Donald Rumsfeld lives, the Secretary of Defense. They said, oh, just go out back. You drive down the road. You'll hit Mount Pleasant Road. Don't go down that road. You make a right and another right. You'll hit Mount Misery Road. Go to the end of the road. That's where he lives. So we got in the car. We didn't go down Mount Pleasant Road. We made a right and another right. It seemed like we couldn't go right enough. But um, <laughs> We went to the end of this road, and we saw the black-tinted uh, windows of the black SUV of the Secret Service, and we knew we had arrived. So I got out quickly with my video camera, and I was zooming in as the authorities were zooming out. And I'm thinking, does Donald Rumsfeld know the significance of this place? But sure enough, as I'm zooming in, I see a plaque in the ground, a stake in the ground, right next to the driveway that says Mount Misery. So. We head off to this ancient black church down the road. It's Sunday morning. Folks are about to have their service, and they're having Sunday school in the sanctuary. And I go up to this woman, and I say to her, could you talk about the significance of this place? I mean, here is Frederick Douglass who was born here. He was tortured at Mount Misery. And now Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, owns Mount Misery, and he's known for torture. I mean, can you talk about this? He said, I, she said, I can't comment right now. We're in church. So. <laughs> From Mount Misery to Mount Hope, uh, I was speaking upstate New York a while ago in a place called Geneva, New York. At the end of the talk, this young woman comes up and says, could I take you to Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester, which was just um, where I would be taking my flight out the next day. She said, I want to show you Frederick Douglass's tombstone, where he's buried. I said, oh my god, I have to leave at like 5 in the morning, but if you would meet me there. And so there she was. Um, we met at 5 in the morning in front of the cemetery in a snowstorm, and we sloshed our way over to Frederick Douglass's tombstone, and we brushed the snowflakes off his tombstone, and it was amazing. And then she said, please, come with me. I want to show you one more tombstone. I said, oh, my God, I'm going to miss my please. She said, okay. So we go across this vast cemetery, and there is the tombstone of Susan B. Anthony the great suffragist buried next to her sister. You know, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass were not just allies, they were friends. 
And when I spoke at Wesleyan College in Connecticut, a woman said, and did you go to Susan B. Anthony's house? Because there's a statue right near there, not of a general, but of Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass having tea together. See, Susan B. Anthony was not only a suffragist, believed in women's right to vote, she also supported the abolition movement. And Frederick Douglass, not only the greatest abolitionist ever, great supporter of women's rights. In fact, he went to the 1848 Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention upstate New York, and he was the one who seconded the resolution for women to have the right to vote, which we didn't get for well, close to a century later. He was seconding it when some women were saying no. That's a little too soon. There was Frederick Douglass. These are the movements that have made our country great, the, civil, the abolition movement, the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement. So I headed off to the airport and missed my plane. <laughs> so I call up Dennis Moynihan and I say quickly, I've got to get the next plane, I've got to get to Denver. He pulls up the blueprints of the airport online and he says, are you in the Susan B. Anthony terminal or the Frederick Douglass terminal? <laughs> I said, no, no, you can fool around here. I've got to get on this next. He said, I'm not kidding. And I look, oh my God, right there in very small letters, it says Frederick Douglass. And in the other wing, the other terminal, it says Susan B. Anthony. Every once in a while you have to stop and smell the coffee, you know? <laughs> so these movements are so important they are what determine where we will go. And it makes me think about Rosa Parks. You probably all know this story and wonder why repeat it. It's one of the stories that's most well known because even this story, the media gets wrong, but is so instructive when it comes to talking about movements. Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955, she sits down on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, refuses to get up for a white passenger and she's arrested and she launches the modern day civil rights movement. Well, Rosa Parks sits down on the bus. A few years ago, she died and we went to Washington. Democracy Now! went to cover the big memorial service. She was the first African-American woman to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Then her body was brought to a large church in Washington, D.C. before the big funeral in, in uh, Detroit. And Thousands came out. Oprah Winfrey was there, Cicely Tyson, and um, we were outside where it's often more interesting to be. People who couldn't get in, there were big loudspeakers, and there was this young woman, she was a freshman at a local college, I said, what are you doing here? She said, well, I emailed my professors. I said, I won't be in class today. I'm going to get an education. <laughs> um, but what did Rosa Parks do? She, that was not the first time she sat down on the bus, right? She had sat down the bus and refused to get up a number of times before. Other young women had challenged the segregation of the bus system. But this was the magic moment. And you never know when that magic moment will come. But again, if you are involved in social change movements, you will determine history to show how brave Rosa Parks was and, and how the media talked about her, by the way. When she died, they said that Rosa Parks was a great hero, which she was. Um, they said that she was a civil rights leader, but that she, they said she was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker, they said. That's where they got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a first class troublemaker. She knew exactly what she was doing. You know, she was the secretary of the local NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She worked under E.D. Nixon. He came out of radical labor politics. He was the president. They've been challenging these race laws for years. She had trained at the Highlander Center, where Dr. King had been, um, to most effectively work white and black together to change the racist laws of the South. You know, she sat down the bus December 1st, 1955. December 5th, she goes to court. The Montgomery Improvement Association, this happened in Montgomery, Alabama, had their meeting to choose the leader to launch the boycott that would lead to the end of segregation. And they chose as their leader, a young minister who had come into town, that was Dr. Martin Luther King. She helped to launch Dr. Martin Luther King. And she knew exactly what she was doing. And to show how brave she was, let's just go back a few months in that summer of 1955 to the summer of Emmett Till. A 14-year-old African-American boy 
His mother, Mamie Till, sends him from Chicago where they live to be with family in Money, Mississippi. And he's visiting his aunt and uncle and cousins. He's asleep in the middle of the night. A white mob comes, rips him out of bed. They beat him, and he ends up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. They said he wolf whistled at a white woman. When his body was dredged back and brought back to Chicago by train, his mother, Mamie Till, did something very brave. She said she wanted his casket open for the wake and the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. Thousands of people sat, walked by his casket and saw his distended, mutilated head. And then Jet Magazine and other black publications took photographs, and they were actually published. And they were seared into the history and consciousness of this country. Mamie Till had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. Could you imagine if for just one week we saw the images of war everywhere? on every Facebook wall, every tweet involved war. The top of every newscast, TV or radio, was a story about war. Um, the top story above the fold of every surviving newspaper, picture and article. Um, a picture of a baby dead on the ground in Iraq, or a woman with her legs blown off by a cluster bomb in Afghanistan, or a soldier dead and dying. For just one week, Americans are, Canadians are, a compassionate people. You would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. That is why. <laughs> Show the images. Uh, in the first column uh, in this book, which I didn't get to read to the Canadian Border Guards. It's about the first weeks in the lead up to the Iraq War in 2003 at the UN Security Council. You know, when Colin Powell, then Secretary of uh, State, gave that push for war at the United Nations, the final nail in the coffin for so many. Um, you know, outside the UN Security Council, a tapestry has hung for decades. It's the tapestry of the Guernica. Pablo Picasso's painting. He, wrote, he painted this in a 21-day rage after the uh, Spanish town of Guernica was bombed during the Franco years. And he said the painting could never go back to Spain until Franco the fascist was out. And he knew it would be destroyed as it traveled the world. So he had weavers in Paris make three tapestry, weave three tapestry reproductions. And one of them is hung in front of the UN Security Council. And it's become this famous anti-war symbol you know the picture, the painting. It shows the pain of war etched in the faces of the animals and the people, the angst, the agony of war. And so there it hung in front of the UN Security Council as the US and UN were making these pro-war pronouncements and it wasn't lost on them. And so they shrouded the painting with a blue curtain it's our job to pull that curtain back to show the realities of war. As Sharif was reporting from Tahrir, right before Mubarak fell, I was writing my column that week on what was happening. And we realized, we heard that Kareem Amr had disappeared. He was this young Egyptian blogger. He'd been in prison for like four years. Um, and he got out. He was in Tahrir, but then no one saw him. He had last been seen a Sunday night walking away from Tahrir. It turned out he was in this desert prison. Uh, he had been taken again. But when Dennis and I were researching for the column, we went to his blog and we saw that it was dedicated to Hans and Sophie Scholl. How many of you know who Hans and Sophie Scholl are? They are brother and sister in World War II. They were Germans. Um, they weren't German Jews, they were German Christians. And they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? And they thought the best they could do was to publish a series of pamphlets 
to let Germans know so that they would never be able to say we didn't know. And they did this with their professors and other workers. They formed the White Rose Collective and they published a series of six pamphlets. And on the fourth were written the words, we will not be silent. And they dropped them everywhere in courtyards and uh, fruit markets in the middle of the night, in the middle of classrooms, in the middle of streets in Germany all over. They were passed from one person to the next. And Hans and Sophie and their professor were captured by the Nazis. They were charged, they were tried, they were convicted, and they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today. We shall not be silent. And it's especially important today as we see this remarkable mass movement growing up all over the world and to see the people who are involved. I went by Occupy Edmonton today and spoke to people. And <laughs> last, last weekend I was in Louisville and talked to people there. Um, of course, I've been to New York and I was just in Kansas City and talked to people outside the Federal Reserve who were camping there. And one of the things I've noticed in a number of these places are the number of veterans who are involved. Um, and you've heard about Scott Olson, what happened to him. He was in Oakland, at Occupy Oakland, and he'd served in Iraq twice. He survived the war in Iraq. but. He was injured by the Oakland police. It's really astounding what happened last Tuesday night. Um, the Oakland police, unlike many police forces in the country, decided they would try to evacuate Occupy Oakland, which was huge. You know, the week before, helicopters were hovering overhead because the hikers were there. They had come to address Occupy Oakland. You know who the hikers are the U.S. hikers, Sarah Shord, Shane Bauer, and Josh Fatal, the three American hikers who were imprisoned in Iran. Um, Sarah for more than a year, and Josh and Shane just let out uh, about a month ago uh, by Iran. And their first public appearance outside the news conference they had in New York was to address Occupy Oakland. They had truly come home, they said. And Shane said, after he'd come out of prison for two years, that he'd already started a fast in solidarity with the Pelican Bay prisoners in California who were on hunger strike. Um, and there they were. They felt it was this important what was happening to join with the protesters at Occupy Oakland. And so here is Scott Olson, this young man who comes back from Iraq, and he is part of the Occupy Oakland encampment. And the police are moving in and they fire tear gas canisters, they fire um, beanbag rounds, and it looks like rubber bullets. It's not clear what took him down, what kind of police projectile did it, but it smashed into his, hell, into his head and cracked his skull. He's lying right, and this is the most alarming part, right in front of the police, right? They've tear gassed and everyone's run away. People don't even know who he is, the other protesters, but they turn around, they see someone's down on the ground. He's right in front of the police. It wasn't the police who came to help him. Remember, police are peace officers. But it was the young people, some protesters came back, they see this guy bloodied on the ground and they go to reach for him and the police slam them with a, uh, with a, a flashbang grenade. And they don't know what is hitting them because they don't know what took him down. And they, it's very frightening when this flashbang grenade goes off. So they run off and then they come back because they know he is laying there. Um, and they pick him up and they take him to the hospital. And that's where he is now. His family there, his friends and many supporters, people who don't even know him are holding vigil outside the hospital. Uh, I don't know the latest today. Uh, he had come into consciousness at some point. He wasn't able to speak a few days ago. Um, but the fact of the matter is, all over the United States, the polls that are done show the majority of people support the protests all over the country and around the world. This despite the corporate media can at first 
ignoring completely. Could you imagine if 2,000 people marched on Wall Street, a 2,000 Tea Party activists went? You'd have 2,000 reporters, <coughs> right? Um, almost no one. Democracy Now!, we'd been at the organizing meetings. You know, we were covering this from way back as we covered the Battle of Seattle, and because we're journalists, we cover movements. What people are doing at the grassroots is very important, as well as those in power and putting them in debate and discussion. That's what the media should be. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches the globe that we all, the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of our country, because they can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have the debates that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they are sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. When I was in Louisville, in Kentucky, I interviewed this young guy who had just come back from Iraq, and I said, so why are you here? And he said, because I went to Iraq in 2008 to serve my country, and I am here at Occupy Louisville serving my country. More than half the population of the United States supports these actions. More than half believe they are the 99%. And it is truly amazing, given that the corporate media first completely ignored this and then started to ridicule it. Um, they were continually saying in these network studios, these know-nothing pundits, what do these people want? I mean, it reminded me of 20 years ago when uh, men were saying, what do women want? Just ask one. <laughs> you know, I mean, in New York, in the, right, the media capital of the world, we are very close to Occupy Wall Street. Just go talk to them. Ask them. What, you don't have to agree with them. You could fight with them. You could debate with them. But ask them. I mean, the eloquence of the people who are there is absolutely remarkable. It's not choosing a select group. You just go down and you talk to many different people. And also the people that are visiting, that are brought to, that come to show solidarity. I mean, just one example. One night I was there, and who showed up but John Carlos? John Carlos, you may remember the most famous, iconic um, photograph in sports history is the picture of the two African-American athletes, the 1968 Mexico Olympics, with their hands in the Black Power salute. Tommy Smith won the gold, and John Carlos won the bronze in the 200-meter dash. And when they went up on the medal stand, um, they had one pair of gloves between them, black gloves. And so one has it on his left hand and one has it on his right hand. Peter Norman was a white Australian who came in second place. He wanted a glove, but they only had one pair. <laughs> but he wore the Olympic Committee for Human Rights, the Olympic Committee or Group for Human Rights. That was their organization, uh, all of these Olympic athletes. And he put on the button in solidarity. You know what else that John and Tommy Smith wore? They wore beads to protest lynching, and they did not wear their running shoes. They went in their black socks, and they rolled up their pants to protest poverty, especially of black children in the United States. That was their stand. And there was John Carlos, how many decades later, right? 50 years later, half a century later, addressing the General Assembly, the GA, at Occupy Wall Street, telling these young people how inspired he was by what they were doing. And there was also Reverend Jesse Jackson went down, right, just celebrated his 70th birthday. Police were moving in on the medical tent the other night, and he joined hands with young people there and said he was willing to get arrested. Reverend Jackson, you know, was at Dr. Martin Luther King's side um, when he died, April 4th, 1968, when he was assassinated in the Lorraine Motel uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, when he went to stand with sanitation workers who were union organizing. You know, that's how Dr. King died. Um, and Jesse Jackson was there then. Last weekend, the Dr. King Memorial went up in Washington, D.C. 
and President Obama dedicated the statue. <coughs> Meanwhile, just down the road, Cornell West, the Princeton preacher, professor, African-American religion studies professor, um, was getting arrested in front of the Supreme Court because he said, if a monument to Dr. King is being dedicated today, someone's got to be arrested. Uh, <laughs> because he said, make, he said, make no mistake about it. It's where Dr. King would be, not at his own monument, but getting arrested, protesting the level of corporate power right now in this country, the level of poverty that we know in our country. Let's not forget what Dr. King said, not often quoted when people talk about his I have a dream speech. But as he preached, one year to the day before he was assassinated, April 4th, 1967, at Riverside Church in New York, taking on the war in Vietnam, he said, I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. The country he loved, calling it the greatest purveyor of violence on earth. And you look at where our country, the United States is, in wars in Iraq, in wars in Afghanistan, drone attacks in Yemen and in Pakistan. Where would Dr. Martin Luther King be? And I just want to end by suggesting he might have been on September 21st in Georgia, in Jackson, Georgia, standing with a thousand other people as an execution was taking place, the execution of Troy Anthony Davis. I'm going to end with this story because it's very fresh in my mind. Troy Anthony Davis, how many of you got to see our broadcast or hear any part of it? And if you didn't, I hope that you'll go to our website. We did a six hour, we didn't intend to do a six hour broadcast, but Democracy Now! headed to Jackson, Georgia, about 40 minutes from Atlanta, where the death row prison for the, where the death row prison of Georgia is. Because this man, Troy Anthony Davis, was set to be executed at seven o'clock Georgia time. We were gonna broadcast starting at six o'clock. It was not clear what would happen. But in the United States, very few people realize we are almost alone in the industrialized world in having the death penalty. Um, it is a very, very serious issue. Over 3,200 people, men and women, are on death row in the United States. A hundred men are at the death row prison in Georgia, actually now 99. And so on September 21st, we went there to just follow this story and to see what would happen. Troy Anthony Davis was convicted of killing a white police officer in 1989. The problem was seven of the nine non-police witnesses at his trial recanted their testimony and said they were forced to say what they said. One of the two who refused to recant was the one that most people point the finger at, the one who pointed the finger at Troy Davis to begin with. They say he is actually the shooter, this other man named Sylvester Red Coles. But anyway, so here you have this man on death row for half his life, for more than 20 years. Three death warrants came and went, and he was not executed. But all of the appeals were now exhausted. And on September 21st, this case that had now gained international attention was um, playing out. Students from Morehouse College and Spelman, two traditionally black colleges in Atlanta, marched to Jackson. 150 people, the corrections officers allowed on the grounds, but everyone else had to stay across the street. So there were about 1,000 people there. The heads of big human rights organizations, the NAACP, Amnesty International, USA, they were all there. The family of Troy Davis was there. And we just started broadcasting at 6 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, when he was supposed to be executed, um, the time came and went. And it then appeared that the Supreme Court was taking up his case and that the point man on the Supreme Court would be Clarence Thomas, who comes from Pinpoint, Georgia, not far from Savannah, where Troy Davis grew up. 
the Pope called for a stay of the execution. The former Republican FBI director, William Sessions, called for a stay of the execution. Former Republican Congress member from Georgia, Bob Barr, called for a stay of the execution. The Nobel Peace Prize winners, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, Jimmy Carter, former President of the United States, called for a stay of the execution. Five police war. Uh, prison wardens around the country called for a stay of the execution, including the former police war prison warden of this prison named Alan Alt, who said, even when they believe a person is guilty who they are executing, do you know what it's like to bring in, you have these civil servants who are people who work in a prison, they're told to execute this person tonight. You are to kill this person. Usually they are there because they are dealing with people who are being punished for killing people. But they are now told it's part of their job, probably not very well paid, to kill this person tonight. He said, it is traumatic even when you believe the person is guilty. He said, but in this case, in the case of Troy Anthony Davis, there is simply too much doubt. There was no direct evidence that linked him to the killing. There wasn't DNA, there wasn't a gun, none of that. And so the evening wore on. Um, when I got to the grounds of the prison that afternoon, the corrections officers gave me the press packet. It was very thin. It mainly focused on what Troy Anthony Davis would be having for dinner. It was absolutely astounding. They said he had refused the meal of his choice. When a person is executed in the United States, they get to have anything they want for dinner before. That's their choice. In Texas now, they're trying to change that because the last man to be executed ordered a very, very large meal. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, Troy Anthony Davis refused to choose a special meal. So what we got as journalists in our press packet, it said he will have the standard issue prison tray. And then it laid out what he would be having. They said he would have grilled cheeseburgers, baked potatoes, uh, oven roasted potatoes, baked beans, coleslaw, cookies, and a great beverage. And then they had another piece of paper in the press packet. It just had four lines on it. It said, pentobarbital, pancuronium bromide, potassium chloride, and ativan, a sedative, in parentheses. So first he would have the meal, and then this would be the lethal cocktail that would follow. The Pentobarbital paralyzes, no, the pentobarbital anesthetizes, the pancuronium bromide paralyzes, the potassium chloride stops the heart. The Ativan, the prisoner can choose whether or not to have an hour before he's to be executed. Troy Davis, in the only two acts where he could exert his will, chose not to have the Last Supper and not to have the sedative. So the execution is delayed for a number of hours. We believe now that he was laid out. It's a kind of cross. It's the shape of a cross he's laid out on because his arms are put out so that they can inject the lethal cocktail. And then at 10.53, we got word the Supreme Court refused to stay the execution and that Troy Anthony Davis was being executed. As the poison was flowing into his veins, I forgot one last thing. They also told us the schedule for the day, nine to three visit with family. At three o'clock, he would have a routine physical before the seven o'clock execution. Routine, physical? As the head of the NAACP of Georgia said that day, giving a speech in the church down the road, who had just seen Troy that day. He said, a physical to determine whether he is healthy enough to kill? 
because that's what happens. Uh, recently, a death row prisoner attempted suicide right before the execution. They raced him to the hospital. He had to get better. And as soon as he got better, they executed him. So at 10.53, we were told by the authorities that the execution was beginning. The chemical cocktail was being injected into his arm. And 11.08, they announced that he was dead. Then the reporters came out. There were four who witnessed the execution. And they described what Troy Anthony Davis did. And they described his last words. The son of the police officer and the police officer's brother were witnessing this. And two people for Troy and four reporters. They said that Troy Anthony Davis looked at the family of Mark McPhail, the Savannah police officer, who was a hero, by the way. The night that he was killed, he had gone to stop the pistol whipping of a homeless man in a parking lot. Troy looked at the McPhail family and he said, I am very sorry for what happened to your husband, your father, your brother, but I am not guilty. I am not guilty of this crime and you should find the man who killed him. And then he turned to his, his lawyers and he said, please tell my family to keep up the fight. And then he turned to the, his executioners and he said, God have mercy on your souls. God bless your souls. And Troy Anthony Davis was executed. His body is then brought for an autopsy and his family has to pay for the transportation and listed on his death certificate, it says homicide. As we ended the broadcast, because the Department of Corrections came out to our broadcast and said they'd pull the plug if we didn't leave right then, it was a quarter to midnight. You know, the show was over. Um, I couldn't help but think about what Gandhi responded when asked what he thought of Western civilization. He said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and I'd just like to end with another quote of Gandhi. As I leave you here today, I'll head off to Los Angeles tomorrow to speak at the Green Fest. Environmental issues are so important. We've got to deal with climate change. Um, and I'll visit Occupy LA as well, hopefully, if I have time. And then I'll come back to New York where there is a, a blinding snowstorm apparently today. And I could only think about the people at Occupy Wall Street because yesterday, uh, without warning, the police had moved in and removed all the generators uh, that were on the site. Um, but as I think about the way the press has dealt, but also the way that the American people have dealt with this protest, actually coming out in support, feeling that finally their own concerns are being articulated in some way. There may not be set resolutions or prescriptions for what should happen, but at least there's this kind of feeling that people across the political spectrum, across ages and ethnicities, are saying there is something wrong with the system. And I think about what Gandhi said when I think about the media and how it has dealt with this and why it's so important that we take back the media. Gandhi, in giving words of encouragement, said, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, then you win. Democracy Now! Yeah.